The Book of Recollections, Episode 22, A Red Dawn, by Dysylvania. Hello, weary traveler. Long day? Maybe I could help you relax with a story that's out of this world, imbued with mystery, a drop of love, a scant of horror, and a handful of adventures. Call me a chef of stories, or call me the Book of Recollections. Either way, lay back and open your ears. The story begins. Um, actually, uh, the story continues. Yeah. Our heroes woke up and soon realized that they were not in the same room where Castiel had done the ritual that transported them to the Fortress of Death. They were in a makeshift hospital, each of them in tremendous pain. Parts of their flesh showed signs of necrosis. Where the rot had set in, emerged a crystallized formation filled with a decrepit miasma that carried the scent of the fortress, and faint glimpses of Castiel. Weird, if you ask me. Those crystals went by the name of Viviantes, and were a gift for the price each character paid during their time in the fortress. The crystals appeared on their bodies because, as Castiel explained, everyone was stuck between life and death over the course of their journey through the domain of death. With the group's approval, Castiel began the painful process of extracting them. But not all members of the group woke up, for Leo still remained unconscious and in a state of arrhythmic convulsion, no doubt a side effect of how many times he had been resurrected. As the group tried to shield Leo's body from unwanted interference, Lunai manifested herself and cryptically let the group know that she would be back later to tell them how to bring their fallen friend back from the grasp of death. Our adventurers returned with the object they sought, while Jen also retrieved her grandmother's heart. She also gained the unique ability to allow someone, upon feeding off her blood, to speak in her accent and change one characteristic of their morphology to resemble the dampier. That, however, lasted for a day. Seeing how they were in dire need of sleep, the group decided to rest, and, upon waking up, Pax and Grace found out that the Chancellors wanted to get Leo expelled from his position. The two agreed that it would be best for Grace to disguise herself as Leo in order to keep the status quo, and, to Pax's surprise, she was more than capable to do it as a shifter. The moment of amazement drew Pax to steal a kiss from the fake Leo, the moment witnessed by a stunned Jen. As the rest of the group met up inside Leo's mansion, they thought it best to split up for the day in order to cover more ground and achieve their individual goals. Pax and Jen went to the Church of Enduring in order to find a way to hide the bodily alterations from Obscuro's gaze. There, he learned from a priest about the method using sheets of silver. Although Pax was against that heretical idea, Jen accepted. Upon leaving, Pax received a letter that informed him that Zamolkse, the ruler of the Red Kingdom, was on the verge of declaring war against the Green Kingdom. This made Pax message Shaklashak and Adam, the snake folk being in the middle of introducing some tavern patrons to his fist. Adam went to the library to look for information about Duragards, a new species of dwarves, and the Star of Hebdom. He found a pagan piece of information hidden in jokes and cooking books. Pax's message found Adam just as he was on his way out of the library, and its contents were enough to convince him to go home and inform his mother about his departure. A drama-filled moment happened between mother and son that also touched on such subjects as marriage and children. Suffice it to say, Adam did not leave his home empty-handed, but with some gold that would help him in this journey. Just before Grace left, Castiel stole some items from her, a brass lamp and an empty orb with cracked fragments within it, and made his way to Saturni's chapel, where he summoned Saturni. The meeting between the man and the astral descended into a heated argument that alluded to the fact that Saturni heard, spoke, and saw no evil in order to atone for her sins, and was perpetually crying because she could do nothing to help those who died. On his way back, Castiel took a stroll through the Cloud District, where he found himself stalked by a white moose. Castiel faced the animal and, after a bit of conversation and some back and forth, 
the white moose was more than pleased to allow Castiel to cut into one of its horns. But instead of it being hard and bony, the horn felt fleshy and soft. When cut, the piece poured a strange white liquid which Castiel placed in a vial. Back at the meeting place, Shaklashak appeared dressed in a green cloak, making him the de facto guardian of King Evander Pax during their journey through the Red Kingdom. As the group said their goodbyes, Adam, Pax, and Shaq went to Venora's Druids, who after plenty of deliberation, let the three use their pre-teleportation method in order to reach the border between the two kingdoms as quickly as possible. Two orc guards awaited on the other side who not only did not pay attention to the half-elf, wishing to interact only with Shaq as they pretended to speak only orcish, but they didn't allow the group to pass the border. As night rolled up, Pax's nerves were on the edge, which pushed him to use aggressive diplomacy against the two guards, but found himself facing a 12 feet tall dusk orc whose impertinence drew our protagonist to shed his weapon, sword and armor and invite the brute to a diplomatic cultural exchange. At the bequest of Lunai, Jen took Leo's body deep into the woods to a place known as the Lady Moon Pool, where she performed a ritual accompanied by the song of a certain type of birds. To ensure that the ritual would happen without a hiccup, Jen proceeded to capture some of those winged creatures. Upon placing Leo in the water, Jen's grandmother appeared out of nowhere, asking her if she brought her the gift. Castiel, Timmy, Kor and the old man found themselves in the basement, where, on a dirty table, a headless Zmeu body awaited them. Cassiel used the crystals he extracted from his friends, arranging them in the shape of a bird's skull. Then, using his memories, he shaped his homunculus into a worm-like minion, which was intended as the brain of the creature. Then, he used the newfound orb, imbued with emotions, as the heart of that strange and new creature. As the ritual was taking place, Castiel urged his family not to be afraid of whatever being might come through and to treat it as a member of the family, even if the entity might want to kill its maker. The earth split as a deep ravine appeared. Sabbath water spilled out of it. Then a blob arose, forming pure ether. The body was disintegrated, and from the congealed blood and heavy crimson mists, Long, dark, red drapes formed. The figure slowly shaped a head. After contorting, an appendix that turned into a hand grabbed an overgrown bird skeleton, its face now obscured by a plague-like mask, their presence terrifying. Emerging from the shadows, summoned by the Sabbath, the ritual was complete. Ether had taken form. This was the recap for episode 22 of Vim as told by the Book of Recollections. I was Ruxandra Vorotnet, your Vim recap narrator. If you'd like to join us as Vim The Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5 p.m. UTC on youtube.com slash New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thanks for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.